Well, good, good evening, everybody, uh, and uh, a warm welcome on what is a cold night and the forecast of more snow. So I'm sure uh, one or two of the people who are due here probably were put off, but thank you all for coming. Uh, tonight's paper, The Evolution of Economic Scenario Generators by the Extreme Events Working Party. Um, before I actually call on the um, uh, authors to, to make some remarks, I just thought I'd muse a little bit. Um, in practice, the uh, use of these sort of uh, economic forecasting projection models by the actuarial profession almost sort of almost exactly coincides with my time of, as a member of the profession. Uh, it, it wasn't really uh, anybody but but the very few uh, experts who thought about these things until the the very end of the 70s. Uh, and the paper very fully describes the evolution of use as well as thinking on models uh, over the, the uh, decades that have followed. And I found it fascinating to think back as to what we were using at different times. One thing perhaps the paper didn't mention, but which I think is, of course, quite critical, when you look back at what people were doing 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it's vital to remember what they could do 10, 20, 30, or 40 years ago. Uh, when I uh, started, there were quite a lot of offices still using punch cards and the various like for their valuations uh, of many policies. And the computers that you used if you were doing a computerized valuation were sort of massive great things that, that had the power of something you keep on your on your desk today, or even carry around in your briefcase. Um, and uh, I think it's important when looking at, at the history to, to just bear that in mind. Uh, the art of the possible uh, was quite critical for the practical applications. And I think the other thing that I, I'm very pleased to see in the, in the paper is there is a discussion of what it is feasible and practical to use. Uh, in actual actuarial work as opposed to what is theoretically in some sense correct or not, although whether anything is in theory correct must itself be somewhat dubious. Uh, but you haven't really come here to listen to me, so I'm not going to carry on rabbiting on any longer. Uh, so the first thing I have to do, um, I'm going to introduce both the uh, members of the Working Party who are going to speak together rather than uh, interrupt proceedings in the middle. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Parit Chakria of Prudential. Uh, Parit is uh, Director of Long-Term Investment Strategy at Prudential Portfolio Management Group. He's responsible for the Long-Term Investment Strategy, which includes strategic asset allocation for a number of multi-asset funds, long-term investment and hedging strategy. He also is responsible for providing advice on capital markets modelling and assumptions across the group. Prior to joining Prudential, Parrott undertook a variety of roles within the, the for joining PPMG, he took a variety of roles within the Prudential, which culminated in the overall responsibility for the production of the Prudential's regulatory capital requirements, Pillar 2 ICA. Uh, Parrott is also a CFA charter holder and has been an active member of numerous working parties for the profession, including chairing the Extreme Events Working Party. He's also played an active role in reviewing the syllabus and is part of the Finance and Investment Board and chair of the Finance and Investment Research Committee. <coughs> Andrew Smith uh, perhaps characteristically has, one of, has given one of the shortest biographies for someone who could have written one of the longest ones. Uh, he has... Uh, 30 years experience uh, of stochastic financial models and is an honorary fellow of the IFOA. Having spent 15 years as an actuarial partner in a large consulting firm, uh, he moved last year to Ireland to take up an assistant professorship in statistics at University College Dublin. So without further ado, over to you, Parrot. Thank you. 
Oh, oh, you're Andrew first, is it? Right, OK, I've got the other order here. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to this. I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, I'm going to introduce the paper by describing what we've done. Um, we describe the need for stochastic models because you've got one past but many possible futures, and scenario generators are the tools that produce these future outcomes. And we've been concerned particularly with economic scenario <laughs> generators that would produce forecasts of things like inflation, interest rates, equity market levels, property market levels, foreign exchange, credit spreads, uh, and so on. But we've, on this working party, we've written a fair number of papers and presentations, many of which have been quite technical, but this time we took a, a different approach. What we recognised was that these models have <coughs> been in use on and off since about the 1970s, became much more widely used in the 1990s. And many of the people who developed those models to start off with um, are now retired. Some of them, unfortunately, are, are deceased. Um, and we thought that it would be a good idea to interview people who had had a big role in developing those models to get their insights and views on what had happened, and particularly to try and get their understanding of when there had been a shift in modelling practice, what was it that caused that? What was the reason for that? Uh, so there aren't formulas in the paper tonight. Um, I think there might be one. Um, but there, there, there are a few formulas. And instead what we're doing is recounting the story as was recounted to us by the people that we set out to interview. And we're grateful to those who participated. There's a few people we're still trying to button down um, to get their views for a final paper. But these are the people who we're very grateful who've helped us so far, particularly those who've sort of come out of retirement and racked their brains to give us some insights of the earlier years when even Paris and I were not um, involved. So here's a, a picture of how we saw the evolution of scenario generators, particularly within uh, an insurance context. Um, in the early years, the first models that were used were random walks. They were borrowed from academic work. There was then a large body of research led mostly by David Wilkie, looking at time series models. And then in the early 2000s, in the insurance industry at least, there was a move to market consistent models. And that involved the almost throwing in the bin of some of the time series ideas. And it's interesting, and I'd like to hear your views as to why you think that happens, and then we're now in a situation where much of the stochastic modelling uses one year of value at risk, and there you might have imagined that actuaries would have dusted off their multi-period models, their time series models, and say, I'm going to cut that off after one year, and I've already got the solution to that problem. But that isn't what happened. Uh, what happened was that people built a new set of models. So what was wrong with the ones that they had had 20 years earlier? And we've tried to identify some, some factors here. Um, one thing that became clear was that it's not only technical criteria that develop the, which drive these model developments. It's not the case that every single model is driven by some new technical innovation which is a better model than before. Very often the requirements of model users were different and sometimes there were things that became fashionable. Uh, so there's social influences as well as technical ones. So we, we conducted interviews with some key players to ask them what they thought about this. So the, the first phase was these random walks, well known from academic studies, and they, they capture one sort of general factoid, which is that in most of the developed markets, you look at returns from one period to the next, and there's a very low autocorrelation. So you don't typically find that you can predict the, next, the direction of the next period's return from the return immediately preceding it. Now, there are questions as to whether that applies. That still remains true over longer time periods, but over short time periods, that seems to be the case. And the random walk models account for that fact, but there's clearly things they don't account for. Most obviously, government bonds maturing at their face value on the maturity date. That's not captured by random walks. There was a lot of innovation of time series models. Here we've got some pictures of some credit spreads. Um, and that, that was something which followed innovation within the academic world in modelling, and um, David Wilkie really led the charge in applying that to 
um, financial time series, and that produced answers which over longer time periods were quite different from random walks, and in particular, equity investment looked less risky using a Wilkie-style model than would have been the case using random walks, quite a lot less risky over long time horizons. Um, one of the great things about the Wilkie model was it was published in a proper peer-reviewed journal, and very few of the other models that we're describing have had that degree of public scrutiny or detail in the public domain. Um, they would also produce some recommended parameters. And, um, but there were some, some difficult questions there. Uh, one of which, so during the 80s and 90s, there was an increase in the use of stochastic modeling and Wilkie model and those sort of models for pensions asset liability studies. And at the same time, um, there was a general increase in the equity proportion of a typical pension fund asset allocation. And we don't think we've quite got to the bottom of what was the cause and effect. Was it that there was a new model that gave some new insights, people revised their view of how risky equities were and therefore funds were comfortable investing more in equities? Or was it that there were some other reasons why funds wanted to invest more in equities and therefore a model which appeared to support that became very popular. It's very difficult to disentangle that. And then you get the phase started by realistic balance sheets of option pricing type models. And this was when actuaries started using models developed outside the actuarial profession, mainly in banking and derivative pricing and adapting those. And these are still used for realistic balance sheets and market consistent valuations, especially in life insurance, less so in pensions. So why did the option models become popular? Well, we've been given a few reasons. Uh, one was there was a financial crisis and a need to value costs of options and guarantees. Um, they were, the failure to do that was exposed by the failure of equi equitable life. Um, there were regulations which required market consistent models. It wasn't clear that that could be done with the time series models that were then in use. Um, and there were ideas coming across from banking. So there were various reasons why these models became more popular in the insurance industry, but not actually in pensions consulting so much. Then there was another phase, which was the one-year value at risk. And so that suddenly everybody became interested in fat tails, because suddenly we're trying to model um, extreme rare events and the kind of normal distributions that have traditionally been used in the earlier models failed to produce sufficiently frequent um, large market falls, large market moves, um, and our, our working party was involved in, I think we had quite an influence in publishing models here that subsequently became adopted in fairly similar form across the industry for Solvency 2. So that's given you a flavour of the different phases that we had identified, and I've got a hand to Parrots, who's going to finish off the presentation. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, so Andrew talked you through the, the different phases over time. And uh, whilst we are doing the same piece of research, we also analyzed the, the, the research, the interview results, uh, looking at a few different lenses. And I'll try and, try and give you a few more flavors of this. Um, one, one of the first questions we, we asked to the, the interviewers, users, developers, um, various people across the industries, what, what the use is of the economic scenario generators were and how they changed over time. A very interesting outcome was that there are some uses which have been prevalent for, for the last 50 to 60 years. So uses such as investment strategy, business strategy, product development, pricing, those, those have been in place for, for a long period of time and those were driven by, by the need to make decisions. So as, as Andrew said, once you recognize that there's one past but many different futures and you want the business to be robust in those different futures, you, you have these, these need, needs for an economic scenario generator and they have been used for, for a number of years. Some of the newer uses are, are the ones where you, you have to report report something, so regulatory reporting, valuation, uh, cap capital, capital modeling, those have only come around in the last decade, decade and a half, and that primarily with the realistic balance sheet, then the individual capital assessment, and, and then so its uh, successor solvency too. Um, what's also interesting is the, the tertiary use. Once they're used both for business strategy as well as 
uh, valuation and reporting, it, it then has a, has a whole host of uses within the business via the use test. It is used for customer literature, uh, customer outcomes, and, and, and a lot of other facets which, which may have not been, been primary uses in the past. Um, one other factor was pretty clear in talking to all of the participants. Um, the, although the use has, has kind of varied in a fairly linear fashion, the awareness of economic scenario generators has grown exponentially. And, and there's, a, there's a lot more awareness and, and in-house knowledge now than there was many years ago where it was, it was a very, very niche set of people who, who understood and, and did all of the modeling. Um, uh, the, the other other question that, that we asked was what, what was the big challenge about about these stochastic asset models and why, why was it such a difficult problem? Um, one, one chart that was very useful is, is how the asset allocation has changed over time. So if you go back uh, 50 years ago, uh, most insurers' balance sheets had, had a fairly simplistic as, uh, asset base. You, you would have government bonds, you would have uh, kind of local local equities, so UK gills, UK equities, and a little bit of cash, and that was that was pretty uh, pretty standard. Then what you have seen is that has that has changed massively over now, over, over time, and now the balance sheet is much more international, which forces you to model the world in in a much more international way. Um, the the other other, other Kind of challenges are extrapolation in time, the liabilities as, as longevity has changed uh, over the last last century or so, as well as the nature of insurance business has moved further away from short-term assurance to whole of life and, and endowment products um, has required an extrapolation in time. Regulations haven't helped because they've asked for asked us for an extrapolation in terms of probability. So not only do we uh, in order to have a perfect model, not only do we need to model, model all the assets, we need to make it more challenging by, by extrapolating both in, times, uh, both in terms of time as well as probability. So that, as I mentioned in this, this forum before, um, if you were to have a truly accurate model of the world, you, you need it to be as big as the world itself. And if you wanted to extrapolate it in time and probability, you'd need it a multiple time bigger. Um, so despite all of that, um, if we were to look back, both ourselves as well as the interviews, in terms of the, the scenario generators capturing the major <coughs> risks, are there areas where we are happy with? Are there areas that we are unhappy with? And that, that was, um, this is the outcome. So ge generally, across time, most, most people felt there was a, a learning process, but the material economic risks had been captured over time. <coughs> One exception to that would be interest rates, where for a number of years, decades even, all of the textbooks um, cited, uh, cited a, a floor of zero in interest rates. They, they called call, call the zero bound. And there were some interest rate models which had an implicit assumption that interest rates don't fall below zero. And in fact, that, that, was, that was baked into the, the actual syllabus until not that long ago. Um, and that, that most people feel is, is the one area where perhaps there, there is a lot of lessons to be learned in terms of how, how interest rate models work and what implicit assumptions and judgment we are making, which we should be very careful about. Um, the other area which is much more difficult is changes of regime. How, how do you allow for that? How do you capture that? Uh, whereas they might be obvious in hindsight, they are much more difficult to expect. Uh, in advance, and one, one example would be um, in 1997 when the Bank of England got independence in terms of monetary policy, that changed the dynamic of interest rates. Arguably, the advent of quantitative easing changed the dynamics in terms of how capital markets behave. How, how do you decide when a regime has changed, and how do you set the parameters for the new regime? That, that's an interesting dilemma. Um, what are the factors that have kind of influenced changed in the past? So and Andrew touched on these a little bit. There have been some factors that have been led by regulation. There have been some changes due to unforeseen circumstances. So in the credit crisis, if, if the, the actual movements in markets were 
who are a, a multiple of uh, standard deviations from what your model predicted, that was incentive to change your models. Uh, it's the same with negative interest rates. And some have been user and development led. The, the biggest example being the, the move from random walk to Wilkie models, which was, which was led pretty much by, by the developers and, and, a, and a fairly niche community. Um, and that, that kind of leads to a number of different criteria. Uh, at, at a very loose level, we could kind of con convert these into objective criteria, uh, such as goodness of fit, accuracy of replicating market prices, <coughs> access things, statistical properties, uh, all, all of those metrics where you could objectively decide whether model A or model B is better. Then there are a number of other criteria which are, which are slightly more subjective and, and what Andrew termed as social factors. Um, uh, kind of what model do other companies have? How, how easy is this to explain to the model to, to lay, lay people? Um, are there any commercial factors? You know, is there a budget constraint? Is there a calibration time constraint? And these, these factors are, are not to be discounted if you look at history. They, are, they played quite a big role in the formation of, of decisions. Um, that led us to, to ask ourselves uh, what might determine uh, models in the future. So if, if you go back in, into the past, you may feel or you may, you may, you may think ex ante that uh, the, the past was a, a continuous evolution of a series of models where one model gets better than the next. Um, but as, as Andrew, and Andrew hinted and as, as we showed in, in the paper, that's not, not true at all. There are a number of um, jump processes, as we des described, which were exogenous events that, that completely change the direction of travel. So if, if we take the, the evolutionary factors, these are all sensible factors where absent of exogenous jumps, this is the direction of travel we would expect to see. So modeling of new asset classes as the capital markets evolve, better modeling of economic cycles as, as as the quantitative easing or post-QE era tells us a little bit more about how markets behave, uh, uh, going further and further into multi-period real world, and, and improving the structure and granularity. But then, then you may have a number of left field factors which make a big change to the modeling in a particular direction. Uh, so new regulations, well, we, we don't know what what doors will be shut uh, after the <coughs> next crisis when, once the horse has bolted. Um, you have market crisis, which might genuinely change the uh, perception of how markets behave. Um, you might have disruptive influ influences. You might have a, a big uh, tech company like Google completely take over ESG modeling by, by creating a model purely from big data. Uh, we, we don't see that happening, but it, it's, it's not something that you could discount. Or you could have social influences. You could have the popularity of something like factor modeling take over and change our thinking to, uh, to model factors rather than asset classes. Um, the, the other lens we would like to put on is, is how, mod how we divide models into whether they're driven by economic theory or they're driven by empirical data and how that has changed over time. Um, so the first models were random walks. Uh, those were very much uh, de depending on economic theory. So there's a uh, Brownian motion, there was a stochastic process and it, it had an equal chance of going left or right. Um, that was a big jump to time series models which were purely empirical. It was, it was calibrated to historical data, fitted to time series, and the parameters were, were purely based on historical data. That again took a jump towards theory as you had the, the Black-Scholes model with its frictionless markets, how it behaves. Um, and a jump back to, to value at risk models. So that, that asks us whether, whether there will be a, a happy, happy marriage of, of both economic theory and empirical data in the next set as we try and extrapolate the, the models further out in time. Um, uh, there, may be a, there may need to be a marriage between <coughs> realism and business needs. There will be commercial pressures, time pressures, um, Kind of pressures to keep the model simple, transparent, intuitive, to 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 be taken in conjunction with the need to to model more complicated features of the market, like volatility clustering, economic cycles, that the correlation across time. 
Um, so th those are all the questions we, we think might uh, influence the next set of models. What we'd also like to love to do is hear from you on, on a number of specific areas. Um, are there any stories of, of failure or, or success of economic scenario generators and the reasons? Um, and in particular, international experience. We are consci conscious that a lot of our, our knowledge and research is, is very UK-focused. We are aware of lots of exciting and different developments in the international space. And if any of you have any comments or have people who, who are able to be interviewed uh, at the international level, that would be much appreciated. Um, with that, I'll hand the hand it back to Andrew to, to open it to the floor. Well, thank you very much. And I, I, I think um, the two presentations have indicated the uh, very well the, the thrust of the paper and the, the interesting topics that it covers. Um, for the purpose of the discussion, uh, I'm joined on the top table by Ralph Franklin, who used to chair the, the Working Party, uh, who's now um, enjoying a little bit of um, retirement. He's from Aviva. And uh, Paul Fulcher Nomura, who will, will close the discussion when we get to that point. Um, I'm going, shortly going to open the discussion to the floor. In, in doing so, um, could I invite anyone who is going to uh, want to speak to, to let me know their intention. Uh, because of the lights, I may not identify you, so I'll probably be doing a lot of pointing. Uh, I see two hands go up already. Thank, three hands go up. Thank you very much. Um, a reminder that the meeting is being recorded for publication in the BAJ, so please clearly state your name before making your contribution, and please wait for a microphone to be brought to you. Martin, you told me even before the meeting you wanted to speak, so uh, you clearly have the floor. Um, if someone could br either bring a microphone or he can go to the... Yeah. Luckily, we was, uh, those of us who have registered and uh, were sent the paper beforehand, so I had the weekend to think about it. So I'll subject you to something like five minutes of uh, what I have prepared. Um, I think this is a... Don't forget to state your name, will you? Oh, sorry, Martin White. Um, I think this is a clearly presented an interesting paper. Uh, incidentally, a Andrew commented that there weren't many formula, I think, with a bit of regret, but it's quite nice sometimes. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the so what questions relating to sec section 10 of the paper, the real world needs which I believe the actual profession could be give it, giving some priority to in today's uncertain world. Um, things I have in mind are financial planning for institutions and individuals and the business of stewardship of savings of individuals. We're in a world where individuals are expected to take increasing responsibility for their own finances. And I believe a greater level of help is required than simply calling for more financial education or recommending that people use a financial advisor. <coughs> but before I expand on some of the challenges where further forward thinking about investment out outcomes versus the real needs of different people um, uh, it, it comes in. Um, I can't resist a, a comment about things like CAPM. Now, I know that the, the paper wasn't advancing necessarily um, such, such things as CAPM on, on portfolio theory, but um, I see them in papers and I find it a little bit stimulating or annoying that um, I think as a profession we made a mistake when we adopted the ideas in our examination syllabus in such a way that gave an element of credibility to the theories that's not justified. Um, by all means, develop theories, but don't actually believe them unless there's really good evidence. The unfortunate thing is that theories are more about what stock prices do than about how the underlying businesses develop. But the lure of the mathematics can so easily dupe people into believing the output. Stock price uh, behavior, especially in the short term, has an element of circularity about it. If everybody believes theory X regarding stock price behavior, then that may prove to be self-fulfilling. In the long term, that's not the case at all, as it will be the performance of the underlying businesses that get reflected in prices. So there's Ben Graham's fa famous saying, in the short run, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. The actual profession has traditionally been the go-to body for the challenge of using assets to meet long-term liabilities. 
but there have been major changes affecting the traditional actuarial role. With profits, life insurance business has been in decline since the equitable, and DB pensions have also been in decline ever since the law changed to make them liabilities of the sponsoring company, and that decline has accelerated as real interest rates have fallen. And I'm going to talk about two specific challenges that are topical at the moment, pensions and PPOs. Pensions, here's the first challenge. I suspect that the biggest and most important challenge for society that the actuarial profession could potentially help with now is what to do with their pension provision. And this needs an objective look from the perspective of the individual saver faced with either the accumulation or the decumulation problem, not from the perspective of any particular member of the financial sector. Especially not from the financial sector perspective, in fact, since I believe the single most important thing that people need to know how to do differently is to how to avoid significant annual percentage charges on their assets. The, the second thing they need to know, there are others of course, is how to face up to, how to manage, and how to accept the appropriate level of uncertainty, which includes understanding how to cope emotionally with market fluctuations. Now I recognize that I'm talking about an ideal world, not one which is as easy to get to quickly, or perhaps ever at all. But if anyone is interested in becoming involving involved in thinking in these broad problem areas, I would be very happy to hear from, you, from them. To me, this is a socially useful application for my actuarial training and my interest in investment. In my utopian world, we have the more knowledgeable savers and investors working together for nothing, helping each other, so that ultimately there is something for the less knowledgeable to learn from and copy. My working title for this idea is currently Savers Take Control, which you can Google to find out more. I don't mind being thought of as more than a bit idealist. If we can do any good at all, it will still be worth the effort. I'm hoping that a number of people will come forward to help who have worked in the financial sector but who have now retired and so don't have the conflict of interest that would make them nervous about campaigning on the issue of investment-related costs. Now, PPOs. The second challenge, or series of challenges perhaps, is PPOs, or periodic payment orders. These are effectively immediate and inflation-linked annuities for life, which are the best way available of meeting the costs of care of, say, motor accident victims, as they provide very well for longevity risk and also moderately well for the relevant inflation risk. Insurers have argued that if claimants take a lump sum, they should be presumed to invest significantly in equities and therefore they don't need amounts as large to compensate them as if they took the lowest risk route of index linked gilts. We'll come back to that in a moment, but the implications of that argument is surely that the insurers, being better equipped in terms of expertise and financial resources, should be investing in equities themselves. After all, a PPO might have an average duration of 40 years with some really young claimants expecting to live in excess of 70 years. And if it is true that an equity investment strategy makes sense, as the insurer's arguments would clearly imply, we have to ask what the accounting regime and also the regulatory regime, with its need to ensure long-term resilience and financial strength of insurers, would have to look like to permit and possibly even to encourage some equity investment in respect of these very long and very real liabilities. Might the thinking behind economic scenario generators help here, perhaps? Perhaps. It, I believe that the profession should be working on this question today. Now, cost of PPOs. This same example of PPOs is one where concentrating on the use of ex economic scenario generators can obscure other ways of looking at the problem. Let's consider for a moment that an insurer has decided how much money it needs to put aside to meet the cost of a PPO. Let's call this the insurer's PPO cost. Taking this as a start point, now let's contrast the position of a claimant with that of, an, of the insurer. We have investment expertise. The insurer will have much more expertise than the claimant. A claimant will need to hire a financial advisor who would be unlikely to have the range of expertise available to an insurer. The next is investment expenses. The insurer will have much lower expenses and will not need to purchase the kind of services that a claimant would need to purchase. The next is tax. The insurer will achieve a gross of tax investment return. 
tax only becoming payable in the event that the insurer's funds set aside, including the gross investment return, proved to be more than needed. A claimant will be a taxpayer, though, and any investment return will be subject to tax in accordance with whatever the personal tax regime may be in the future. And, of course, there's great uncertainty of what that will be. The last point is the ability to take investment risk in order to achieve an optimal return. The insurer has a scale of assets and capital uh, that the claimant does not have. And for a claimant, the negative utility of running out of money has to figure more importantly than the positive utility of ending up in a surplus. Putting it another way, the claimant can afford to take much less risk than the insurer. What these considerations lead to is a very simple conclusion. They all point in the same direction. Whatever amount the insurer needs to put aside to provide a PPO, the insurer's cost, the amount that a claimant needs to provide to provide the same thing has to be very materially higher. This is, that is not the lens of fairness through which the ESG-focused discussion on the Ogden rate that took place recently was looking. So just because ESGs are available, I think we have to be very careful to put them into a proper context for the problem in hand. Thank you. Towards the front here. John Spain, this paper is excellent. The authors are really to be congratulated. However, um, when one says one past, many futures, this isn't really true. In terms of the past, we don't actually know where we have been. Just think of pre crisis liquidity assessments. And as for the future, it's not many futures. There is only one future. There are many possible futures. But knowing that there are many possible futures, if those are disclosed to the stakeholders, including, for example, PPO claimants, it would be possible for the stakeholders to get some better idea, far better than looking at one number where somebody, an actuary perhaps, has said, this is the capital value which needs to be paid which needs to be reserved, which needs to be priced. We should get away from thinking in terms of capital numbers and start looking at explaining to stakeholders you've got a 5% chance of going bust or a 95% chance of going bust. Do you feel lucky? Um, I think actuaries could be doing a lot better than we've been doing so far, having concentrated for so long on one number, which destroys the information. It doesn't enhance it. We are not helping the stakeholders. Thank you. Hey, Hugh Work of Eva UK Life. I've got some short comments. Say, the first of all, a, the use of option pricing models in ESGs was largely driven by their use in banking and, and uh, mathematical tractability. But in deriv derivative pricing and banking, the, 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 the terms of the, that they're considered over tend to be much shorter than actuarial liabilities. How suitable do you think, you mentioned extrapolation in your, in your presentation, how suitable do you think these models are for the long term? nature of actuarial liabilities. Eh? And the second point I've got, the, you're, you're pushing the discussion towards a multi-period real world ESGs. These, these typically, how, how would you make the distinction between risk neutral and market consistent in an ESG? Do you think the two terms are synonymous or, or can, they be, can they be distinct? Do you, either of you want to pick up on that one? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't think that risk neutral and market consistent are synonyms. Um, the market consistent models are ones which are calibrated to reproduce market prices of instruments. And so they could be ones where all the risk premiums are zero, which are risk neutral. Or you could have ones where risk premiums are non-zero and deflator type models. So the market consistent is a way of calibrating. Um, the so-called real world uh, usually means models that are 
calibrated to historic models, measures of, let's say, of correlations of volatilities, rather than those implied by market prices. So market consistent models are not necessarily um, risk neutral. Um, your question about the terms, the, the models that are used within banking to price options, some of those options will be quite short dated, but there are, for example, um, interest rate swaptions with combined terms of 40 or 50 years on which you can get pricing and there you're into the realm of um, the same terms as some of the longer dated insurance liabilities. Of course, the interesting thing there is that the models, particularly in euros, the models which the banks are using to price those long dated derivatives um, are not the same ones used by insurers because the insurance rules allow you to disregard the yield curve beyond 20 years in the euro and not use the market rates. Um, so there we've got something which is kind of the other way around, where um, the insurers are using a shorter term approach in a way than the, the banks are using all of the market information. So I don't think it's quite as clear cut as to say there are short term problems and the bank's models are fine for them. Uh, actuaries look at the long term, therefore we need to to make our own way. I don't think the distinction is, is quite that clear cut. As, as far as the uh, uh, real world versus risk neutral versus market consistent, if you, some uh, real world interest rate models incorporate a term premium, you can certainly set these to zero and, and they become essentially risk neutral models. If you have a view that you want to model a term premium in an interest rate model, it can be difficult to strip that out when you want to return to market prices. How would you approach that problem? So if you're trying to replicate market prices of bonds, you certainly can put in a term premium, and the deflator technique is one way of doing that, which enables you to model a premium for longer dated, unexpected returns on longer dated bonds um, than on shorter dated bonds. Um, but if you're still calibrating to market prices, that will then also affect the distribution of future interest rates. Because when you're observing a long dated bond to calibrate your model, you're going to attribute some of that yield to being a term premium rather than the expectation of interest rates. So your trajectory of mean interest rates will be further downward sloping compared to a model that was calibrated to zero risk premium. There's some quite subtle interplays there. Yeah. I guess the other way to think about the term premium would be as a risk premium. So in an arbitrage free model, you don't have any risk premium and, and all your assets earn the same as a risk free asset. In a risk neutral model. In a risk neutral model. Um, and that's, that's forced by the arbitrage free condition. In the real world model, you are allowed to have a trade off between risk and return and say in order to take on specific risk, be it asset volatility risk, be it term risk, you receive in exchange a, a set of premium. Um, and just a quick follow up on your question on term and, and the different different terms available. I'd, I'd second Andrew's point that even within equity options that you do get different prices from the banks and clearly the owner of the economic scenario generator will need to make some judgment as to how far they take the information from the banks and how far do they uh, do they blend it with their own views for further down the line? Uh, Smelcom Kemp. Um, I uh, um, also want to uh, thank you, uh, thank all the authors for a great paper, uh, most interesting uh, with lots of different insights, and uh, I do remember some of the history myself, so thank you. Um, uh, the one area that I thought would be just helpful to comment on, it seems to me, in my opinion, that the uh, best way to think about uh, uh, the uh, economic scenario generators is that they're trying to solve two different problems at the same time. Uh, the first is to place a, a, a fair value, a market consistent value, uh, call it what you want, uh, on the um, uh, uh, on some kind of uh, payoff, uh, and it's the insurance and the uh, pension fund and the actuarial way of doing so, uh, and it borrows a lot of ideas from elsewhere within the financial world, particularly the banking world, uh, to do that. 
And then the second problem that, it's, uh, that these uh, generators, ESGs, are trying to solve is how do we take decisions? How do we decide what to do uh, if we have an investment view? Uh, so the first is uh, investment view agnostic, and the second is investment view not agnostic. Um, and uh, the real world models are trying to do uh, the latter. And I think a number of the uh, historical shifts that you have described uh, uh, are a consequence of greater and greater focus coming through on those two different areas. Um, uh, and uh, it seems to me you raised a few questions about the, um, uh, whether the shift of assets towards equities into pension funds uh, was a result of uh, the additional developments that occurred. Uh, my recollection is that, uh, to some extent, it was the reverse. Uh, we decided as... Uh, do you want me to stand up? Would that help? <laughs> I don't think you're causing that light up there. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK. Um, uh, just to say, I think that the uh, shift towards equities was in part uh, an investment view that the uh, pension fund industry took collectively and I suspect some of the changes that came through with ESGs were in part to reflect that. So it's the cause and effect. Uh, you're positing that the entire cause was, or, uh, was down to uh, refinements in ESGs and I would like to suggest that perhaps some of it was the other way around. Thank you. Towards the back on that side. Thanks very much. This is Dimitri Gott. Uh, again, thank you very much for uh, a very interesting uh, paper and presentation. Uh, for me personally, it was a little bit of a nostalgic blast from the past because uh, in early 2000s, uh, I was uh, a chair in a subcommittee of the South African profession, which developed professional guidance on the use of stochastic model, uh, kind of following three, four, five years behind uh, the developments in the UK. Um, what I wanted to reflect on a little bit uh, in the, in, uh, for, for this discussion, though, is the use of real-world models specifically. Uh, the two points that uh, stand out for me, firstly, is that I think both with the mm, time series models and the VAR models, there is a temptation to fit models to the data, either by fitting the time series or fitting a distribution to uh, realizations over one year horizon. Um, to the extent that we do that by using maximum likelihood method moments, whatever techniques available to us, I think we might fail to recognize that historical experience is just one past of many possible pasts that could have happened. And that, uh, to an, uh, that may cause us to underestimate future uncertainty. So maybe at the other extreme, a, a very prudent approach would be what would be the most prudent or the most conservative stochastic model, or sorry, statistical model that still would not be invalidated by historical data. Uh, so we, we could be looking somewhere between the two extremes, either exactly fitting to the, to the historical data or uh, taking, taking a more conservative view. Also, I think a second comment, what we shouldn't be losing sight of is not just the as particularly with the VAR models, not just the probability, but the range of outcomes. Because with focusing in one in 100, one in 200, whatever VAR cutoff point we have, what I think we'll lose, we'll lose sight of is how badly things can really go in reality. Because if we do underestimate the probability of extreme events, and events that we did not account for do happen, we may be ill-equipped to or unprepared for their financial consequence. So not only should we be aware of probability of, of the outcomes, but of their impact on the business. Thank you. Uh, 
I don't see a hand at the moment, so I'm going to put some challenging thoughts out to see whether I can provoke anybody. Uh, but if someone waves, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. For the... one, one, one thing that I think, um, extending from some of the comments that have been made, I, I think we sometimes lose sight of what, what is it all about. And ultimately, we are concerned with the ability of financial institutions of whatever shape or size to pay the money to some member of the public, uh, a, a naive person for the purposes of this discussion, uh, as and when they, they're expecting to receive the payments. And very many of the developments we've seen over the last few years have been actually focused on developing more and more complicated point balance sheet tests. Our uh, predecessors used to do, use all sorts of methods of valuation which were actually not so concerned about point estimates, but the emergence of surpluses, the, the appropriate funding, uh, uh, and so forth. Have we gone too far the other way? So we are, we are absolutely obsessed with what the balance sheet numbers will be in 12 months' time, and not concerned at all about whether that actually really reflects 10, 20, 30, 40 year liabilities. Martin. It's difficult to say no in answer to your question. Um, but. Um, Something that I think we should understand quite well as a profession is the way in which institutions interact. So if one bank lends to another bank and is allowed to take full credit for that lending, you eventually get an unstable system. And I don't think it's just about testing the resilience of companies in isolation. I think it's testing the resilience to all sorts of things you might consider that then have domino effects, and how resilient are we to these domino effects? I think the answer is hardly at all. And indeed, most of the systems we seem to create as a society actually probably magnify those domino effects rather than mute them. It's Malcolm Kemp again. I think in the vein that you're describing, uh, you could make uh, the argument you're trying to put forward. I think another alternative perspective on this would be uh, what do institutions actually do uh, with these funds and the way the business models that they run. And uh, over um, the last maybe uh, 20 or 30 years, institutions have typically de-risked um, and it's uh, a reflection of some of the uh, thoughts that you've just highlighted. Uh, they've moved away from holding the risk themselves, uh, but of course uh, equity markets have continued over that period to grow, so the risk has not disappeared. Uh, it's uh, shifted into individual hands, uh, maybe through unitized uh, vehicles, but uh, uh, so there has been a shift of risk away from the institution towards the individual, uh, and uh, whether that's good or bad, I think is a, a different topic. Um, Andrew, just to comment on your question earlier on whether <coughs> whether we are focused too much on a on a short term distribution uh, at the expense of longer dated liabilities, and and I'd say. Um, that, that, that also is, is kind of captured by Malcolm's description of the two main uses for economic scenario generators, where there is a business use, so the need to make decisions, the need to make decisions in the context of long-dated liabilities. You try your best to understand the state of capital markets and where you might end up in 10, 15, 20 years' time. And there have been some short-term um, diversions where the regulations has has required the companies to focus on a very specific part of the distribution uh, which would be which would be the short short date distribution so that that has definitely made an impact um, the question is once that has manifested itself and the uh, solvency two models have stabilized do the companies kind of look up 
from the one year and go back to thinking about how to make business decisions. And, and I'm very much hoping that for majority of the companies, the answer is yes, uh, to, to go back to the fundamental nature of the business and, and link it to the modeling. Yes, because I think to some extent, the reason I was throwing that, that thought out was I th think it's a partial answer to something that Andrew said earlier about the, the shift, the sort of the throwing away of the time series models and the universal adoption of the, of the, the uh, one year VAR and, and similar things through the regulatory impact uh, has shifted focus completely. And I think uh, you, you, you got it right, um, that, that, uh, Parit, in, in, in those last remarks, that we somehow need to, to, to bring together those, those ways of thinking. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Chris Squirrel, um, Service Analytics, and uh, we have a product called Financial Canvas. And I think picking up on, on what you've said, and we, we'd agree, we, we support a lot of companies in delivering ESGs, and whether that's looking at capital requirements or increasing whether that's looking at um, taking decisions and how to do that. And actually what we've seen over the last year or so, I think, is a, is a focus away from the impact on short-term measures to people starting to look more about long-term measures and look at what might happen over the long term. So we, we, we see less questions around what is our one-year VAR, what's our interest rate risk, what's our inflation risk, and we see more focus on what's the probability that the members' benefits will be met in full, what's the probability that the company will fall into trouble leaving a, a shortfall that can't be met and what would be the impact of that. So we, certainly from our perspective as a supplier of you know, technology to enable people to take views and assess the impact of those views on the decisions they're trying to take, where we're seeing the questions framed more in those ways, I, I would say, than, than in, in recent years. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, again, I thank the authors for a very thought-provoking paper. Uh, my name is Stuart Jarvis. Um, so I, I just wanted to pick up on something that Parrot was saying just then around, uh, I guess, the use of the ESGs. Often what you're looking to do is to understand the impact on a business. And it, it, I think as uh, we often think about it, and as you characterise it, I think we think about what's the impact of what's going on in the capital markets on a business. Whereas it's interesting to think about where some of these models have come from historically, that uh, historically I guess to be much more focused on what's going on in the broader economy. So um, I think it's figure six in the paper. If you look at the, the way the Wilkin model was structured, there's very much a focus on what's going on in the macro economy, if you like, which then influences what's going on in capital markets, then you feed through into the, into the client problem. And that kind of three level staging of where you start with the macro economy is something which is, I think, very interesting, which maybe some of us have have lost in the development of ESGs in the last few years where we focused entirely on the capital markets and we forget what's driving those capital markets, which is the, the economy. And the economy itself then has an impact on the business. And so but I think maybe if I think about where we go next with ESGs, one thing that I'd like to see, and maybe this is something you could comment on, is thinking about how we could incorporate models of the broader economy as well. So when I think about modeling of the, the economy, then there's been a lot of work in the economic literature, I guess, about the way that the economy is, is modelled. So there's a kind of, and this is not something I'm an expert in, and perhaps none of us are experts in, but perhaps something that the profession should spend more time on is thinking about uh, the way that the economic uh, prof uh, profession, uh, the um, academic economic profession, I guess, has developed its modelling of uh, of, the, of the economy. So you've got these DSGE models now, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, which have been developed. Uh, you get the, the, the sol there's these PK conditions and so on that lead to ways of having them be uh, reasonably well calibrated through, through modeling. Um, they typically focus on things like inflation, unemployment, growth, the kind of the big things, if you like, in the economy. They don't have very much to say at all about capital markets. They might, they might, they might spit out a, a short rate, they might spit out a risk premium, and that's really about it. Um, so there's nothing like the kind of the breadth and 
uh, subtlety of modeling capital markets that we need in the kind of things that we have uh, for our clients. So if there's a way of kind of incorporating both of those together, and then I think that would enable us to give much more, uh, much richer analysis for our clients and the kind of the way that their businesses are potentially influenced by uh, the future scenarios that they may be facing. So that was a thought and a question, I guess, and maybe a direction of future research. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Just a quick word. And, uh, I think we'd definitely agree with you, and the way we tried to characterize it, if you look at the second green box, um, was to, to consider a way of extending the economic scenario generators so that they take input from the, the global economic cycle and, and the kind of possible futures thereof. Um, as you said, this hasn't been heavily researched in the domain of economic scenario generators historically, and hence is a, is a relatively new area. And, and because the, the pricing of market instruments is uh, economy agnostic, a, a lot of the recent focus of the profession in the last two decades has, hasn't quite been on this front. So, so our view is absent a new new spotlight from the regulations in terms of which direction to evolve. Well, this feels like a natural evolutionary direction to go into. Um, Martin White again. In response to the last point, um, we have a, a, a small project going on within the actuarial profession in relation to economic models. It's supported by the a research and Thought Leadership Committee. Um, we've hired an academic to help with this. And um, what he's been doing is talking to various actuaries about how they use economic theory implicitly and explicitly in their work. Um, what prompted this was actually concern that things like the stochastic general equilibrium models really didn't reflect reality in, at all. And inconvenient things like banks have been simplified out, etc. Um, and the idea that the, the world really isn't at all equilibrium, it's always in major flux. Um, this, this work's been going on for some time and there will be some public meetings where the thoughts are shared, but the real purpose of the public meeting will be not just to share where we are, but also to ask for people's thoughts about where we should go in, in the future. There is um, economic research being sponsored by the government in all sorts of places. Um, basically a new economics thing, um, rethinking macroeconomics. And we don't quite have a seat at that table, we, we, get, we get involved a little bit. And in order to think what we might need as users, we hope to influence that work going forward. Hello, uh, my name is Rishi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for uh, such an intriguing paper. Um, I'd, I'd just like to <clears throat> add a few points uh, on some of the comments uh, that were made earlier. Uh, the first one uh, being uh, a need for um, uh, some of uh, uh, this knowledge and some of these uh, modeling aspects uh, being transmitted to uh, the general public uh, because they are uh, being given more responsibility for making investment decisions. Uh, I feel that uh, there is a general distrust uh, amongst uh, uh, the public about uh, economic models. Um, uh, I, I remember uh, there was a very complex model that came out uh, uh, at the time of uh, the Brexit voting and it was like a super complicated model and uh, uh, it was uh, maligned uh, by uh, the Brexiteers as uh, utter nonsense. And um, I, I feel that there is a general uh, requirement uh, for educating uh, the general public and maybe coming up with simpler models uh, which uh, could be uh, used in a much more effective way. Um, also, second point I'd like to uh, say on the last point of the last slide, which was uh, uh, the use of judgment. Uh, I think um, regulator has taken uh, uh, an initiative and kind of uh, taken the whole industry 
with themselves uh, on the use of judgment. Uh, a lot of the uh, companies were just using data-driven models and uh, I think regulators have uh, kind of said that uh, using models, uh, data-driven models blindly is, is not um, uh, allowable. Uh, so I think uh, uh, use of judgment has become much more prominent uh, uh, in, in models uh, now and uh, going forward as well. Thank you. Yes, so the example you chose isn't going to do anything to enhance the general public's acceptance of economic models because, if anything, uh, the, the models weren't exactly right, were they? So, uh, even if they're easy to explain or difficult to explain, public scepticism will be high. Any more contributions? Don't, don't be that, actually, if I may. Mm. I mean, the, the Brexit modelling, being political for a second, I mean, it does, in a way, the mistake that was made there was trying to provide a sort of a point estimate, if you like, just someone made that comment earlier about, you know, saying, you know, just simplifying things down to a single message. And, you know, there was a number put out there because they thought people could take, you know, a GDP hit of X. Um, you know, I've seen people put it the other way around and say, well, you know, I can't tell you how much you're going to weigh in 20 years' time, but I can tell you that if you exercise regularly and sort of eat healthy food, you'll probably weigh less you know, than if you uh, don't exercise regularly and eat beef burgers. But I can't actually, but that, the, it's not a failure of my prediction, if you like, if I then I actually can't tell you exactly what you're going to weigh in 10 years' time or five years' time. And I think that, that difficulty of communicating modelling based on did it get the right answer, okay, it was a big fail, the, the Brexit example, but it's, I think the point still stands that the public in one sense probably wants a number and then will be able to verify whether you've got it right or not. It's probably more helpful to give them a range of outcomes, but if you give someone a range of outcomes, you can never really be proved right or wrong. I'm not quite sure how you get around that. Unfor unfortunately, the... Um the, the general public will see it something like your uh, your model trying to tell you them the result of the 330 at Newmarket, and you coming up to the conclusion, well, one of the horses is going to win, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and therefore they'll they'll completely reject the whole thing. Well, and also because if your model tells you that the horse has got that's got four legs is more likely to be the one with three, <laughs> doesn't actually invalidate your model that the one with three somehow wins. <laughs> I mean, Yes, the, the public wouldn't accept that one either. Uh, are there any other contributions, particularly for people who haven't spoken, uh, or, or those who don't have an in-depth knowledge of the history of these models over the last 40 years, which uh, uh, are able to bring a fresh pair of eyes and maybe have been, had them opened a little bit as to how we got here? No? Uh, well, if there are no other contributions, uh, I'll invite Paul Fulcher, who's uh, head of LM Structuring for Numura International PLC, responsible for delivering Solvency II ALM and Capital Market Solutions to insurance across Europe. Uh, and he also chairs the Life Research Committee of the Life Board. Yes, so first of all, on, on behalf of the Life Research Committee, I would... Uh I'd like to thank the Extreme Events Working Party for yet another very high quality sessional paper. Um, also, as, as various speakers have uh, alluded to, quite nice to read one that I don't have to use Google too much to understand what some of it means, uh, and that not with too many formulas. Um, not that there's anything wrong with those, but I think it is it's actually very refreshing to read a paper that takes a very technical subject and boils it down into something that I think would be widely understood even amongst the less technical parts of the profession. And I think that's particularly critical here because for stochastic modelling, as again I think a few speakers have sort of hinted or suggested, we are doing something sort of very technical, but ultimately if we can't explain it to boards, if we can't explain it to the, the consumers or the customers of that, of that research, of that, that modelling output, then we haven't really achieved our goal. Um, and maybe as actuaries at times we focus a little bit on doing the calculations ourselves and telling you the answer is 2.7, um, it's actually often more useful for people to understand how you got there, the assumptions you made, the insights you got from the modelling, as, as one of the speakers said earlier. Um, 
I think Martin, you know, thanks to Martin for kicking us the discussion off. I think he made some very interesting points. He, he made the point about focusing on long-term business performance rather than short-term price behaviour as something that maybe as actuaries claiming to make long-term financial sense of the future we should be doing. And I think it echoes some points that Andrew made, um, you know, that the weighing machine, not the voting machine, use that analogy. Um, and I think Stuart Jarvis sort of pulled that together nicely with the fact that maybe macroeconomic modelling is the way to sort of bridge that gap. Um, but the big challenge for us is sort of understanding we have macroeconomic models, we have capital markets models, um, particularly I think on the life insurance sector, and this is a, a little bit of a life insurance focused paper. The macroeconomics is great, but we do actually need to understand the capital markets. And, and as Martin said, there's some research going on to try and pull those together. And that's research I certainly hope that gets a lot of attention from people in the profession. It's being done probably quite low profile at the moment. Probably Martin knew it was happening. I know it was happening because we're all part of the research community. I suspect most of the rest of you didn't. So it's probably incumbent on us to, to get that research out there when it's available and to get people's input into that. Um, Martin also, I think, made a very eloquent plea for socially useful applications of this sort of modelling, like long-term personal retirement provision and savers taking controls. I think he made some very interesting observations on, on PPOs and maybe even possibly a misuse of stochastic modelling to, to get a certain conclusion on the Ogden discount rate. Um, that's probably a, a topic for another discussion, but it was certainly a, an interesting topic. Um, I think the other question that was that came up in the paper and was raised in the audience is this question of whether option pricing and these sort of these financial economic theories are, are really suitable for the sort of long-term guarantees. The Parrot and Andrew both answered that, uh, answered that very well and said some of the things I would have said. Again, the other thing I'd draw to people's attention is another area of research that we've just kicked off, um, and we're literally just kicking it off, the Equity Release Working Party is about to commission a piece of research because that's a very classic example, I think, of a, of a type of guarantee, the no negative equity guarantee that insurance companies increasingly not banks write, that is a very sort of, it's a guarantee offered in a market that's very illiquid, and to the extent there are derivatives or observable prices, they're very short term, but it's a very long term guarantee. And we're just trying to actually interrogate the, even the theoretical question, what's the right theoretical way of valuing those in eggs. Um, we had a research working party about 10 years or so ago, the Hosty Working Party, which pretty much said you could do it in a completely market consistent way based on what you can see and the answer would be this, this end of the spectrum. You could base it on real world, how often does an equity, negative equity guarantee ever actually cost an insurance company any money at all and you pretty much get the answer zero and then you can have you know a massive range in between. That, that was a, a useful piece of research, but it doesn't seem like the right answer to say the answer can be anywhere from you shouldn't provision for these guarantees all the way to you shouldn't be writing these products, um, which is basically the conclusion they reached. So we're trying to narrow that gap. And again, although it's focused on equity release, it might have wider application. Um, and then I think Malcolm drew out the point, Malcolm Kemp, that, and I think the paper also draws it out, that some of these changing model dynamics over time have really been because we're answering different questions over time. Um, particularly in the life sector at the moment, there are two questions, I'd argue maybe three. Um, are we sort of just trying to measure the fair value of reliability, sort of an agnostic view, as Malcolm put it? Are we trying to make long-term investment decisions in the present of an investment view? And then because of capital models and solvency too, this whole one in 200 year VAR question, which has almost been imposed on us, if you like, and of course, the, diff the models that suit those different purposes aren't necessarily the same model. And some of the, some of the sort of controversies and discussions are really because we're trying to answer more than one question. And maybe it just isn't one model that does all of them. Um, I think it's interesting, it is a life-focused paper to look at the pension sector. And I think the gentleman, I didn't catch your name, unfortunately, who spoke towards the end, I, I guess your comments were more pension-focused in terms of the modelling you're doing. It is interesting in one sense, the pension sector is less constrained by regulation and therefore arguably more able to take the long-term view. I mean, that, that itself has led to controversy. There's uh, um, <clears throat> Mr. Exley and Mr. Smith and Mr. Mater, who's not here, wrote a very famous paper 21 years ago. 21 years ago, I think it was presented in this hall that definitely argued for applying option pricing to pension guarantees and led to some, I think, very important changes to pension 
Ma pension management, maybe that pendulum, certainly in the life sector, has gone maybe too far, though, in terms of market consistent approaches and, and not looking at the long term. Um, so it's perhaps interesting, I think, and maybe an area a little bit for it'd be nice to have maybe got a few pension actually speaking, we didn't tonight apart from one, um, to understand what the life sector can learn from the pension sector and vice versa, because I think they have gone rather different routes. Um, I'd also just comment, I'd, I think I'd agree with Malcolm on the causality point. I would say, if anything, the Wilkie model probably enshrined beliefs that actuaries probably had dated from the 70s and even the 60s, um, the sort of imperial tobacco pension fund started, I guess, that 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 equities were a better long-term match. And in a way, the, the Wilkie model sort of <coughs> enshrined that in a stochastic model that gave you the answer that you first thought of. Um, so I think probably the equity allocations led the modelling rather than the other way around. Um, but yes, just to conclude, I think this was a, an excellent paper and a very good discussion. Thank you for that. Um, and I'd certainly like to thank both the working party and we should say to thank the interviewees. Um, there's a lot of interviewees named in the paper who gave their very valuable time um, to give the working party the input. And I think we should uh, be delighted at what's resulted. Thank you. <clears throat> Just before I, I conclude the meeting, uh, when I was looking through this paper uh, beforehand, I, I was thinking, uh, and, and something John Spain said uh, during the discussion um, reignited the thought about there, there, is, there is actually one past and there is actually one future. And to some extent, you could, you could see the, the evolution and development of the models themselves as something of a, um, a, a stochastic process itself with uh, intervening events such as regulatory change or, or um, crises or whatever leading to changes in the way models are being developed. And I think the great thing that this paper does is to actually stop the clock for a moment and actually get people to look at what we're doing and why we're doing them. And for that reason, if not for the, the other reasons that other people have already spoken about, about the excellence and approachability of this paper, I really would like to, to thank the authors for the work they have done, uh, for the contributions that they have made uh, to, to the meeting, uh, to uh, Paul for summarising what has gone on very well, uh, and uh, to everybody in the audience who's participated to what I think has been a, a very interesting and stimulating discussion. Um, it would be helpful uh, for those preparing the transcript of the discussion for the BAJ if you could hand any prepared notes to the members of the profession and staff at the back of the hall as you leave the meeting. And at that point, I'd like to thank you all once again for attending and wish you all a safe and not too uh, uh, snow-affected journey home. Thank you very much. <laughs>